I am so glad to see you guys in beautiful Boulder, Utah. I want you to explain to our viewers exactly where Boulder, Utah is. Tell us a little bit about being there in the shadow of the monument and why the monument uh, matters to climate change. Boulder, Utah is um, largely considered to be the most remote town in the lower 48. Uh, we are a private inholding inside Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in Garfield County, which is a 5,000 square mile county with only 5,000 people. It is the case that the monument was declared in 1996 by President Bill Clinton. And then we moved here to Boulder shortly thereafter at the very end of 99 to open our restaurant, Hell's Backbone Grill and Farm, February of 2000. Um, very clear about the power of a extraordinary landscape and a lovingly prepared meal. And that was basically our business model is how can we help people fall in love with this landscape and nourish them deeply as they do so in order really to protect the land and help kind of build a coalition of people who would love it and care for it and steward it as the years went on. Little did we ever imagine that it would come under attack and, you know, the way things are now, it's um, been largely, uh, largely unprotected and opened up to oil and gas by executive order by the Trump administration. And so that's a very sorrowful thing for us. So delisting the monument has to do with the politics of gas and oil, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Unfortunately for the monument and the people who love the monument, the monuments are in the state of Utah. So it's not just Grand Staircase, it's also our um, sister monument, the Bears Ears, which is um, near nearby. They were both decommissioned, you know, largely or, or dramatically reduced by executive order. Sadly, the state politicians in Utah were very much in support of that happening, which is why they chose Utah because they thought, you know, with the support of the of the Utah delegation, it would be less of a battle. But they didn't totally count on all the people like Jen and I who um, will fight for it. You have been fierce warriors there on the land. Um, you also were very early on farm to table people, um, not because it was a trendy thing to do as much as it was a matter of necessity. Tell me a little bit about making a restaurant work in that kind of farm to table and environment where you are um, 180 people, I think still in town and five hours from Salt Lake City and the middle of nowhere. Yeah, so we started our farm in 2005, but we opened with gardens. So partly it was like there was, of course, necessity. I'll say that really like the larger kind of reason to do it was um, that we believed it was the right thing to do. You know, I um, worked for Greenpeace in my late 20s and you know, the science around climate crisis hasn't changed, particularly since those 30 years ago, nearly. And so the idea of reducing our, our carbon footprint, of employing good, strong humans to grow food rather than having it shipped in from somewhere far, far away from dubious sources and questionable um, workplace practices and all of that was really appealing and so we we wanted a garden you know we were like we're going to try to walk in Alice Waters shoes you know and do it in the middle of nowhere like Alice is our is our shero and so we were we started with gardens and then we we began with a proper farm in 2005 when we realized the gardens you know were were not going to be able to produce enough food for what we needed we just tried a salsa garden a little salsa garden in the corral because they didn't deliver to us but once a week and that food was was not nice was <laughs> so we tried the salsa garden and then it went to Blake's house and then into the farm which is 
a pretty serious undertaking. <laughs> <laughs> we try to call it Blaker's Folly instead of Blaker's Acres because it's been quite an endeavor. You know, it's very complicated to grow food at high altitude where we are. You know, the high desert is a, a magical, remarkable place, but growing food here, you know, has some inherent challenges. Yeah. <laughs> And water also being tricky. Yeah, we're very fortunate in, in Boulder. Um, we have, well, and our farm has a good supply of irrigation water. Um, Boulder is, is, a, is a lucky place to be situated. You have been very outspoken. You, you both have, but certainly like you have, uh, <laughs> in terms of fighting about um, the delisting of the monument and what that does mean to climate change and what it does mean to your little place of the world. You spoke about it in an article in the New Yorker that talked about this has come at personal cost to you. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, the costs keep coming. <laughs> the, the check, the bill is, the bills keep coming in. But, but honestly, I mean, Jen and I both are activists at heart. You know, from an early age, Jen was working with Planned Parenthood. I was working with Greenpeace. We're feminists. We're environmentalists. We are. Um, we want to see a more beautiful world emerge. We want to be free from all the various sick systems. And so, whatever Jen and I had ended up doing in this life, I'm assuming we would have probably picked. Um, a way to try to make a difference or move the needle. It it ended up being the case that, you know, we landed our restaurant in like the reddest county in one of the reddest states. And that, you know, for a long time that went really well. Like we made a real effort to be sort of a bridge in our community to employ local people to host events. That went really well for a long time. Unfortunately, you know, when our beloved Hillary Clinton didn't win the election. We um, immediately saw the writing on the wall and, you know, I resigned off all the boards I was on and was like, Jen, we're going to have to fight full time to save this monument, probably to save the planet too. You know, now our fight has sort of morphed beyond the monument into actual climate crisis. And we're working more these days with climate crisis nonprofits um, because, you know, the monument fight naturally if we did, if we save the monument but not the planet we haven't saved the monument and truthfully 85 percent of utah's biodiversity is contained in That's grand staircase say. the bees the bees yeah. <laughs> save the bees there's well there's they've identified scientists have identified 665 distinct species of wild bees in grand staircase it is absolutely the case that saving Grand Staircase and Bears Ears, that their fate is, you know, if we can save them, it helps save the planet because we, in order to bring the habitable qualities of planet Earth back from the brink, we need to save vast intact swaths of wild places and intact um, species and diverse ecosystems, excuse me. Um, you are a Buddhist. You have brought to the, the restaurant, the monks. They've brought great energy there. Um, and, and you are both peaceful humans. That said, you yeah. <laughs> in your hearts, you are peaceful humans. That said, though, there have been, I think, threats against you, threats against the restaurant. There have been maybe gunshots, maybe tires, maybe things that have happened to you along the way. This is not just um, an intellectual fight for you all. This is uh, in the trenches fight. Is that right? Is that fair? I think that's fair, fair to say. Yeah. I mean, we are, we have an extraordinary crew, our staff, you know, and, and before anyone comes to work for us, we're like, just so you know, just so you know. Um, we do this thing and we're fighters and fighters for the good, you know, and our staff are also fighters for the good. And we are very like together in this, but it is the case. Like last year, we had a lot of, we had a lot of problems with our staff um, getting their tires damaged 
and you know our building's been vandalized we've had you know gotten a lot of hate mails currently if you look on um like the review platforms like yelp and stuff there's uh, definitely a lot of hate mail <laughs> a lot of uh one star reviews like say, that have nothing to do with the food as i understand no or the ambience or the service no, no of Just course not. basically you know jen and i um we've had a black lives matter sign in our at our restaurant for four and a half years you know that's it's we're not new to the fight for social justice either we are um you know we're we're sort of i would say holistic in our in our activism it it runs the gamut women's rights indigenous rights social justice issues black lives matter and then environmental stuff and this as we've gotten a little more famous and our our platform has gotten bigger it's um you know more people are noticing what we've been up to and and our you know and i i don't regret a second of it it has been you know it's painful and isolating sometimes you know the polarization that we've seen happen in our larger society has certainly occurred here in our town and you know the rhetoric and sort of bombast and vitriol of the Trump administration has certainly infected even our what was you know a pretty peaceable little valley for a long time for me personally there is no choice. Like I don't wake up in the morning and feel like I have a choice whether or not I use my voice against injustice. If I see injustice, I'm going to speak up. Have you learned lessons during COVID that you think you will take after COVID into what you're doing? Um, it turns out I love wearing masks at work and uh, <laughs> so I'll probably continue to wear a mask. Um, but that's, I mean, in all seriousness, I think the lesson that I would say we've learned is that, um, you know, is sort of how to scale things so it works better for our employees and ourselves. I don't think we'll ever, you know, go back to our old model. What Jen and I want is, <laughs> if I could be so bold, we want out of the six systems of the patriarchy, the six systems of white supremacy, the six systems of extreme capitalism and the industrial military complex. We want out of that. And so we're going forward, you know, having had this sort of hard pause and reset, I think we will feel we have more free agency to make choices that reflect our, our deeper values. We're listening to our staff, we're listening to each other, we're listening to our guests. We operate on extremely thin margins. We're very susceptible, but, but particularly women-owned businesses and, and um, people of color-owned businesses are historically not funded by banks. They're historically not supported by investors. And so I think um, sort of realizing how vulnerable restaurants are, and then that makes our employees and, and the workers in the restaurant industry really vulnerable restaurants as it turns out are very much essential workers and it was very difficult to get ppe gear for our staff initially and i think going forward like really looking at what the true costs of restaurants are i think um, the general public needs to be more aware of how little money restaurants make how expensive it is to employ people in an ethical way I really want to see us move away from, you know, sort of the the six systems of supply chains. It's been really hard to get the food we need, you know, especially clean food during this time. What we've learned is that the restaurant industry is really fragile. Women-owned businesses are very, very fragile. And and that that there's that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in our society around supporting smaller smaller businesses in general, but definitely restaurants. I think the other thing that Jen and I feel a lot of like sorrow about in terms of the way COVID has expressed in the restaurant industry is seeing the way um, a lot of restaurants didn't take nice care of their employees. Um, basically forcing people to go back to work without proper PPE um, laying them off in mass, you know, 
And I would say that while it may mean that Jen and I have never really made money in our restaurant, we are, I feel a lot of like pride and success around the way we've taken care of our staff. And I just really want to um, say right here and now, I really want to see a, 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 a total adjustment to the minimum wage. Like Jen and I don't belong to any restaurant industry, um, kind of restaurant industry. Uh, Associations or. Thank you. Yeah, any restaurant associations because they all lobby against raising the minimum wage. And that's a sick system we want out of. We've never paid a person in 20 years minimum wage because it's it's inhumane. We don't all live in wonderful, beautiful places where we see every day why it matters to pay attention to climate change and why it matters where we go to eat when we go out. What can the average bear do going forward on the planet to be uh, respectful, to help with sustainability, to be thoughtful in how they dine? So our farm, um, our practice of farming is regenerative agriculture, which actually helps um, to decrease carbon outputs. So you're trapping carbon in the soil. Also the beef and lamb that we buy is um, pastured in such a way as to do regenerative ag. So I would say learn, you know, it's really important for consumers of food um, to really look at where their food is coming from. And sure, it costs more to buy maybe from a small farmer, but it, you're I, paying a real person, but you're paying a real person and, and exactly. And you're actually helping to um, address climate crisis rather than, than, than moving it forward. 